ECGR 4101-5101, lecture number 16. Today's little quick app of the day is just going to look at the, uh, at the Future Electronics System Design Center. And if you, uh, uh, we talked about this at our last, uh, or one of our, our demonstrations for the lab. This has on it uh, some nice prototyping areas. Have I gone into this in more detail? I think maybe I talked with somebody about it individually, but not, not all together. But if you look carefully at this, there are several aspects of this that are, are pretty neat. One, notice this area right here has a surface mount, mounting area that you could put on, you know, how many pins is that? A certain number of pins. Uh, man, I can't even read. 16. 16. And uh, then there's another area over here that has surface mount area for eight pins, another one over here for six, another one over here for eight. What does this look like right here? Say it again? It might be something like a voltage regulator where you have uh, uh, multiple, multiple pins that will handle something that is three or four pins with a big giant uh, uh, area right up here for, for the chip. You also have this up here. What do you think this is for? Say that again. Give me a hint. There's this big old slug there. What do you typically need something big, huge piece of metal for? Heat sinking. Heat sinking. So that's going to be something that has a heat sink, which is typically what? Some sort of transistor, right? Whatever fits in that with uh, two pins. One end, one pin at the other end. Notice all of these also have holes in the board, so you could run uh, wire wrap wire from one place to another. You have a lot of uh, positions here for putting surface mount resistors or capacitors. Oh, here's another place for uh, uh, a larger uh, set of pins. A little prototyping over area over here for uh, through hole pins. Looks like you could put a couple of headers on there. And lo and behold, what's one of the headers you might want to put on there? Whatever will connect to the Renaissance board that uh, you can plug in directly below it because it has on uh, the Renaissance board itself, the uh, RX62N, it actually has uh, the same area, a place for you to plug in. I'm trying to think, does it have the socket or do you have to put it in yourself? Yeah, so you have to put preferably the socket on the Renaissance board and then the, uh, uh, the mail header. On the uh, on the extension board, and uh, nothing on the back, but uh, this is probably the area where you're going to be soldering anyhow, right? Because if you have through hole parts, usually that's where you solder. So that is the uh, embedded app of the day. You put anything on here, including a small microcontroller. In fact. If one of those pins was 18, it'll nicely fit a, uh, uh, a Texas Instruments MSP430 on it. So uh, you can put a different manufacturer's chip on that as well. Any general questions before we start up? Being none, we're going to start talking about the serial peripheral interface. This will be a relatively short lecture, uh, but this is a general concept that is, uh, that is important for um, many situations. There's not only this, but there's also the I squared C. And so I'm going to show an example of where you would use the I squared C in a second. In the world of uh, serial communications, usually point to point works fine, but sometimes you need to connect to different devices. Now, you can connect to a lot of different devices using parallel lines. So, for example, uh, RSPI, which is the Renaissance uh, Serial Peripheral Interface 
They like to put Renaissance in front of it. Uh, what, they, uh, what you can do is you can hook up different types of um, peripherals. For example, uh, accelerometers or uh, I'm trying to think of a good, oh, the, uh, some memory cards work with this. Maybe a serial memory device, an EEPROM device, in other words, uh, a big, huge uh, uh, chip, maybe uh, something similar to a flash card or a, a thumb drive that can uh, communicate via serial using the serial peripheral interface. But you want to, uh, or you may want to provide several of these peripherals. And so you can hook up several of these peripherals and using one single interface at the microcontroller save a lot of pins by not having to worry about the peripheral, uh, I'm sorry, the parallel pins going to each one of these devices and by having a very high speed bus transmission one way, receiver one way, and usually you're not using all of these at the same time. Very often, you're all, most of the time, you're only using one at a time. So you can, for example, uh, communicate with one of these devices using the serial peripheral interface and by supplying the device a clock, I've mentioned this before in an earlier uh, lecture, by having a common clock between the two of you, you have synchronous communications as opposed to the UART which we saw earlier, which was asynchronous. In this case, we have a synchronous clock which is always generated by the master, which in this case is the Renaissance chip. You have a line there called master output slave input which is the transmit line from the processor you have one called the master input slave output which is the receive line and then we have something that is very common in the digital world is if you have several chips out there you can have a chip select line so by saying there's one line up there SSL 0, SSL 1, SSL 2, SSL 3 you will have three or four different devices that you could turn this one on and that one and that one and that one. Uh, in particular, the SSL lines are active low. So they're held high and if you want to select that one as who you want to communicate with, then you drop the line. It says, okay, I'm going to be receiving something or I'm going to be sending you something. Keep in mind, when you're working in this situation where it's master-slave, the master always initiates the first communication. And usually the first communication is, here's a whole bunch of data, come and get it, or I'm going to send it to you, get ready. Or it sends a message over and says, I want this, give it to me. And then it waits for the data to come from the peripheral, uh, the peripheral device. So, in this case, the uh, SPI bus in, is a de facto standard that has been established for many, many, many years. It is really intended for short-range communications, meaning on the board itself. It's not really intended for going off-board. Some people try and do it. You can get up to 10 feet. You're lucky. Um, this should really be something that's limited to a couple of, uh, a couple of centimeters. Even though it can work with as few as three wires, it's typical that it works with four, maybe a few more. You notice here, um, the first two wires up there identify the clock, input and output. And if you have just a point to point, that's fine. But if you have uh, additional peripheral devices, then you'll need to have one line for each one you want to access. Uh, interesting enough, there are two SPI masters on the Renaissance chip, and we'll see later where you identify which one. Is it zero or is it one? And, uh, uh, let's see, I set everything up there. Woo, excuse me. I think I pretty much set all this stuff. Serial clock, uh, master out, slave in is the different transmission lines, slave select lines, active low. You could have a situation where there's multiple masters, and, uh, this gets pretty, pretty complex, and so I'm not even going to go into it. In fact, the easiest way is just to identify that you're going from one to another. And often what you see in this situation, let's see if I can draw this up here with my little pen. 
Often what you see is to make life easy, they'll just connect this wire like this so that the protocol is the same uh, when you try to communicate with the master. And this is again on the RX62N chip and some other type of uh, slave device. So there's a whole bunch of registers of which I'm only going to touch on a couple of them. And in fact, they just go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, but some of the ones, of course, we're communicating. We need some sort of control register. In fact, we have more than two. We have, uh, uh, if I added this all up, uh, we're somewhere around 10. These are some of the big ones. So let's, uh, let's look at some of these right away. Remember how I mentioned you could run with a, uh, a four-wired method versus a three-wired method? And again, it's always clock synchronous, but if you run with the four-wire method, you actually have a peripheral device that, is, that knows when it is allowed to send. And that's one of the uh, um, things that you might have to hook up that fourth wire, because remember, if we saw in the, one of the previous drawings, if you are in this mode where you're tying SSL to low, what does that mean with respect to uh, active? What did I say the SSL signal was? Active low. So that means the uh, peripheral device is always on, which means that if it wants to start sending, it could. So instead, you have the master, which actually will control when the peripheral is going to send. Usually you want to run with uh, a full duplex. There's only a few situations where you have only one-way communications. There are different uh, ways to set up the uh, uh, device. In other words, the... Uh, the whole idea you want to do is, is enable, whenever communication comes in, you want to enable interrupts so that when something comes in and it's time for you to read, you don't waste time just sitting and polling. We actually uh, look at interrupts in a later chapter in more detail. Then we're going to revisit a lot of this code when we look at how you use interrupts for communication. So another uh, control register actually helps you identify parity. You've seen that before. Bit 0, bit 1, same concept as you've seen before. And uh, there's some other bits there that we don't really care too much about. Oh, I put this in uh, as a side note. You can actually identify your, uh, your system or uh, um, your slave select polarity, in other words, is it active high or active low? And uh, just set everything to zero so that's going to be active low because that's the way on our Renaissance board it's uh, created. The nice thing about having a synchronous clock is you can transmit very fast. In fact, here it is. The maximum is 25 megabits per second. However, as you can imagine, anytime you have an electrical circuit, if you want to operate at an extremely high frequency, what do you have to worry about? Noise. Right, say it again? Noise. Noise. So, if you trans... What the heck? Oh, I hit the wrong button. SPI is good. For short distances, problems uh, with high speed, noise, what else? Some of my double E centric people. Say that louder. I can't hear you. Impedance. 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 Oh. What, what, what's the correct word? Impedance, right? Ooh. 
believe it or not, the other problem is reflection. If you start having short, uh, short wires with nothing terminated or not terminated well, you might have reflection off the end. So, you should only communicate at the speed of which you need. At the, let's see, max speed you need. One of the reasons why, let's see if I could pull this up in our book. You know what? I almost hate to do this, but I saw a better picture on Wikipedia, <laughs> which actually was a fairly good example of what's important when you're talking about uh, communications. This was, uh, let's see, I did SPI. And that picture was this one right here. When you're communicating, remember I said it's synchronous. So what it does is both sides look, and this is C pole zero, where uh, on the rising edge of the clock, the data should be valid and is visible, or transmitted from one place and, and valid on the other. If you look at this carefully, it is right in the middle. So you put the signal, or the, the master puts the value on the line, whatever it is, a single value, zero or one, right? And then in the middle of that is the rising edge of the clock, which instructs the slave at the other end to read that data. Then on the falling edge of the clock, the next bit of data is put onto the uh, serial line. And then on the rising edge, the slave peripheral device will actually look at that in, in more detail. We'll look at it. So as you can imagine, if you make this very fast, the width of the availability of this is small, and any sort of noise or any sort of uh, problem, glitch, whatever that might happen, has a better chance of affecting your communications. So by going slower, you make this time right here longer. So it's better to communicate at the slowest which you need. Now, how much hardware or how much software is required to transmit? You pretty much say, here's a button. You set up all the registers, and you say, here's a bunch of bytes, go, right? And the hardware worries about clocking everything and worrying about uh, transmission and, and receiving a specific uh, data byte. So it really doesn't matter how fast it goes in most cases for the software. The hardware will worry about the actual transmission itself. All you have to do is put the, put the byte out there. So does it cost you anything to go slow if it's OK? No. So consider that strongly. There are two different registers that you need to set for your, your speed, and these are examples. As you, could, uh, as you could see, there are all sorts of different types of uh, values you can set for this. Of course, if you're going to work at the fastest, this register, which is a serial peripheral bitrate register, You've seen something like that before, right? With the UART? It had its own one, and then it had another set of bits that you can control as well to, uh, to identify which, uh, um, which of these are how if you want to go faster. So in other words, it gives you uh, two ways to set the speed. Roughly, it gives you what? Uh, a whole bunch of different, uh, well, in fact, we'll look at this in a minute, a whole bunch of uh, different bits, more resolution than, uh, than you probably need, but let's look at the details. 
So if you're looking at BRDV, you could divide by 2, 4, or 8. Or you could use the base bit rate that you provide in the SPBR register. There are some other settings in here. Notice here, you're either working on the odd edge or the even edge. Or your sampling or the variation. The standard is, and it's usually best to go with, I should say, the, uh, the value at default. As well as polarity setting. Uh, signal assertion setting. In other words, this is the location where you get to identify which one of the serial peripheral devices you're actually going to be working with. You also get to identify how much data you're sending. So, for example, you can send 8 bits or you can send 32 bits. So the nice thing about this is that you can fill up an entire 32-bit register, actually two 16-bit registers, say send it, and then you don't have to come back to it for a while compared to doing only 8 bits at a time. You could also identify is it most uh, significant bit or least significant bit first, and some of these others we're not going to worry about. Just like in the regular serial device, you can actually identify or you can actually check on errors. You can check on parity, mode fault, Renaissance serial peripheral interface. Is it in idle state or is it currently transferring? In other words, you can check to see if, if it's free for you to send or if you're going to need to receive. If you were to look at the uh, schematic for our board, and in fact, here, let me pull this up really quick. I'm assuming you have the same thing I have. I have not looked at the uh, schematic that appears on the board. I'm assuming there is one on the board, right? Has anybody looked on the board for the schematic? Or on the uh, CD? And it's there? And it is very bottom schematic. Does everybody know how to read a schematic? I should say, if I were to put this on a test, would everybody know how to read this? Who would not? I think I'm going to give a quiz on this. It depends on what I ask. So every, if I were to give you this entire schematic in seven pages, and I asked you to tell me this and that and the other thing, you'd be able to do that, right? Do I need to cover this, yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes. All, right. All right. Let's talk about reading a schematic. Obviously, at this point, you can't tell anything. But one thing I can tell is that uh, Epson apparently donated a lot of money or chips and so they got their name on it. All right, you have a lot of numbers. Well, actually, you have something here. Obviously, what does that say? That's your part number, right? Or your part. We have these little itty bitty numbers all the way around the side. What do you think that means? All right, that is the pin number, specifically the location of the pin on the chip, and it depends on the chip itself. There's a picture of this somewhere. There he goes. Yeah, as you can easily see, 
Man, that's horrible, isn't it? I bet you it doesn't get any better. Well, maybe it gets a little bit better. So if I look at this, it says that pin 1 is right here. And usually the dot is right near pin 1. So there's 100 pins on this chip. I believe we have this chip, right? So if we look at the drawing here, it says 1 is VCC, 14 is VCC. Going back to my, uh, my drawing here, oh look at this, 1 is VCC, 14 and 60. Let's see if it's on 60 as well. Yep, there it is, 60 is VCC. Also important is uh, ground. So where's my ground? Usually you put your grounds right next to your power. So we have VSS. VSS. VSS, 62. That's it? We have uh, VSS for the USB over here, but that's a different pin altogether. So uh, where's my, there we go, 3, 12, and 62. Gosh, you guys are good. What is this down here? Clock. Crystal. All right. Crystal. Clock crystal oscillator. Notice it says 12 megahertz. Are we running at 12 megahertz on our chip? Or 24 or 50? What is it? 50. 48 megahertz. It's 48? 48. Okay. So is this a 12 megahertz crystal or do we have a 24 on our board? 12. I'll have to look. 12. So it looks like the, uh, the, the processor has a, a uh, quadrupler for the um, CPU part of the processor. And the peripheral clock is running at 24 megahertz. This is interesting. Here's another clock crystal. 32.764 kilohertz. Why do you think that's there? Say that again? RTC standing for real-time real clock. A, uh, this is often what's called a watch crystal or a crustal in this case. Um, you know what? This is an advanced version of the, of the board. I don't have the latest. So I'll have to get the latest from, uh, from the CD. But the reason why you would put this on there is that they're usually a lot more accurate than something like a 12 megahertz. 12 megahertz will probably drift over time. A 32 kilohertz watch crystal does not drift very much at all. They, uh, they have gotten to the point where they manufacture that and it works really well. All right, so let's look in here, uh, some of the uh, parts in here. Look carefully, you can actually see which ports are available for you to use. So what do we have here? Here's port. 40, right? And port 41, all the way through port 47, right? Okay, Mr. Wolf, what is it? Port 4, bit 0. Ah, port 4, bit 0. But notice it has other things associated with it as well. ADC count. All right. So the ADC, or the analog to digital inputs, are port 4. And it's hardwired to port 4. So there are no ADCs over here on port D. And if you look uh, carefully, there are some, there should be some more here. I thought there were some more. I might be thinking of one of the bigger chips. Nope, I don't see any. Or if I can, I can barely see them. All right. So here's another one. Here's port A, right? But it also says A0. And if you look carefully, A0 through A7, A15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. What do you think that stands for? Address. All right, address. Remember earlier I've talked that with this chip you can communicate, or you can have on-chip RAM and ROM, or you can go off-chip to your RAM and ROM. And to do that, to access memory 
off the chip, you actually need address lines. So here you go. These would be address lines A0 through A23. So how many address lines does that give you? 24, which is how much memory? 16 mega. 16 mega. Say that again? 16 mega. 16 mega. 16 meg. So 2 to the 24th. By the way, you're going to be pulling in data. Where do you think these data lines are? <coughs> really carefully. Here we have D1, D2, D, D0, D1, D2, all the way through D15. So obviously it's pulling in how much data at one time? 16 bits. So, do you really have 24 address bits? Or how much memory do you have? Is it 2 to the 24th or is it 2 to the 25th? 24. So how much memory can you read? This might be a very good quiz question. No. Well, in this case, if I say that I have 24 address lines and I am bringing in 16 bits at a time, right, into the processor, then I really have two of the 25th memory locations that I can access. Because if I'm pulling in two bytes at the same time, I don't need to reference the odd and the even byte, right, because I'm bringing them in anyhow. So I'll just kind of shift the address over one, your way, one, and I have access to two to the 25th bytes, which is, is that 32 main? Something like that. Well, one of the aspects I'm looking at, oh, if we look on here, what about uh, our UART, our communications? Do we know where that is? Should be port five. Port five. All right, so let's, let's look around port 5. Where's that? Oh, it's up here. And do I have anything up here that looks like it uh, has anything to do with communications? And I'll, uh, I'll pull this up here. Which bits was it? Oh, this is port A. Sorry. Yeah. Is there anything down here that looks like it's communications? Right, here we go, right? We have TX and RX. And interesting uh, enough, we have, it says LCD module. This is console UART output. So it looks like our main one is going to be port 5, bit 0 is transmit. Port 5, bit 2 is uh, receive. We also have some other pins in here that are used for interrupts. Oh, by the way, also notice here we have uh, our, our clock signals going in. Looks like this has something to do with USB. That's not a part of this class, sorry. And uh, I'm looking for... Uh, TD, TMS, what do you think that's associated with? It might be something having to do with uh, timers. Anything else here? Interesting, our uh, push buttons, which you would figure would be a uh, a digital line is connected to the analog line, right? But what else is it connected to? Interrupt. It's an interrupt line. So going back on here, one of the things I wanted to look at in more detail is something with the SPI. And lo and behold, it is port C. And if we look very carefully here, Oh, here we have the SPI bus, and then it's also associated with the 
Oh, S S L A one two three. I'm looking for zero. Oh, here it is. S S L A zero. So we have the uh, the selection. Also notice this. It says two three five seven with a signal. So this is the chip itself. This is a signal somewhere in some one of the other pages. So what do you think 2357 means? Page 2. It means page 2. So let's go to page 2. We're looking for MS or um, MOSI and MISO. Will we see anything like that on page 2? Uh, look at somewhere on this page. Look across. Well, here's a nice big old chip here. What is this for? This is a big RX, DX. This is some sort of communications chip. Epson. Oh, it has its own 25 megahertz clock. Probably an Ethernet control. Say that again? Probably an Ethernet control, except Ether somewhere in the dome. All right, it looks like it's Ethernet. So we were looking for uh, uh, MS or MO. Oh, look at this. Ether Physical LSI. What do you know? Oh, here we go. MOSI and MISO. So it's communicating with something over here called oops, Beagle Board Header. What it is, is it's a, uh, it's a header on board that you can plug stuff into to find out and communicate with the board. But we also said it was on page three, right? So let's go down to page three. Now oh, here, here's a nice little area. We're communicating with uh, RS-232. This is the, uh, this is usually your RS-232 chip, setting it up for uh, the voltage that's being transmitted. RCAN. Remember I said there's a uh, automobile CAN bus and here's all the CAN information. Looks like it has its own receiver and transmitter lines that go to the processor. And here we go. Here is MOSI and MISO. It says Red Pine Wi-Fi. Ooh, I didn't know we had one of those. I'll have to see if this is, oh it says header. So there is a separate header board that you can plug into a certain slot, and lo and behold, it's also going to be communicating via the uh, uh, serial peripheral bus. And where do we select this chip in particular? It says Wi-Fi chip select, right? So the Wi-Fi chip select is going to come off of this board. Here it is, right here, Wi-Fi chip. Wi-Fi chip select, and it turns out to be SLA2 or SSL2, right? By the way, remember I said there's two, there's two uh, SPIs. One is going to be A and the other is going to be B. I don't think we actually have B coming out. Pin 16. Say that again. Pin 16. 16. I'm not sure because I don't see an MOI, uh, MOSO, MOSI coming out. It may be. Uh, it's on page five. Keep going out. SSLA 2B. I'll have to look at this in a little bit more detail. Yeah. All right. So has everybody got a good idea of how to read this? By the way, if we're to look at some other stuff on here that usually shows up on a schematic. Uh, what's this? Can you see it? What are those? Fill up capacitor. 
pull up capacitors, almost. There's another phrase for it. Called decoupling capacitors. In other words, you're given power, you're given ground, and then you have different capacitors, notice here, of different, different values. So we have a 0.1 microfarad, we have a 10 microfarad, and another 10 microfarad. These may actually appear all over the board, but they just put it here. They place it here. Here's another thing that they have. Here is a switch with, now, now you can use that word. What was that word again? Pull up. Pull up. Resistors. resistors, thank you. At least you said resistors, right? And look, here's another one. Here's a couple more pull up. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> Decoupling capacitors. And notice that it's 0 0.001 microfarad. And why do you have different values of uh, um, uh, microfarads and picofarads, etc.? Why? Why would you do that? Eliminate noise. Eliminate noise at various frequencies. Various frequencies. Oh, look at this. They even have some things uh, say what's big Indian and little Indian. Oh, you can actually run it big Indian or little Indian. Wow, this chip has so much stuff on it. And actually, for compared to previous classes, this, this has a lot of stuff on it. Uh, some more decoupling caps. You can never have too many. Here's an inductor fed to a uh, test point. Uh, looking for some other stuff. Oh, this right here. You can also have a, uh, a, a plug-in power supply for this board. And if you do that, it'll run it through a uh, Regulator? Man, this has been too long of a day. Oh, look what time it is. I'm losing time. Or you could use the uh, uh, regulator that uh, is fed through the USB device, which I'm... Did I miss the USB device? No, it's probably on another page. This looks like uh, something around here. USB host, USB function. There's two USBs. The reason why uh, that's important to know, one is actually uh, for communicating and downloading to the uh, uh, communications board. Or, I'm sorry, to the communications chip on your board. The other is actually one that you can control. And USB power, here you go. If you uh, use USB and you supply power, it'll actually, using switches, feed it into the entire system. Which then will uh, uh, regulate it to 3.5 volts. I'm not going to see where they do that. Somewhere around here, they convert it down to 3.3 volts. Uh, LCD character display, they did away with. Here's a uh, extension card. Notice that they have headers like this. This is how they uh, show you that they're working with headers. Uh, here's your serial flash. Notice you're communicating with your serial flash via the SPI bus. And this is one of the main things you might want to use the uh, SPI bus for is to download to the serial flash, which is Looks like it's 16 meg, but I'm not positive on that. You have an audio amplifier circuit and uh, a microphone, and we will probably use this for lab number six. So we're going to have you record and play back data with this board. Um, your micro SD, again, is connected. Here with the uh, serial peripheral interface device. And notice that it's uh, chip select right here, CS, is going to be the signal that's SD DS. Your temperature sensor is going to be via I squared C. And in fact, 
where did it go? There is also, oh, it's a little bit further this way. The accelerometer is something you communicate with the I squared C as well. So notice that the uh, I squared C address, this is important for the homework assignment, 3A. So if you communicate with the uh, accelerometer, you can just look at some of the code that's in the book. And in this case, you want to communicate with and send the address 3A, and that will be the one that will respond. All right, let's go back to our notes. So in this case, if we look at the, uh, the directions that we're setting up, we've seen this before. You're setting up the direction. What does one stand for? Output. Output. So if we're looking at bits four, seven, five, actually five through seven, or four through seven, what do we have here? Five is going to be the clock. Six is going to be the output. Seven. Say that again. That should be a zero. Yeah, this one down here, you're saying? Yeah. So maybe if we want to receive, we need to set this at zero. Yeah. So I guess we found a bug, huh? And then the chip select for ours is this one right here. We said it is bit number four, so that's also output. So it looks like this one we should take a look at. In the book it's right. So it's Say that again? In the book it's right, it's got a zero. Oh really? Yeah. Oh I guess I copied this from the old the old notes. In the book I have, it, uh, it shows it as zero, or as uh, one. So I'll have to look at that in a little bit more detail. Okay. So based on the communications earlier, or based on what I, what I described earlier, all of these are set up, and the example is in the book with respect to uh, the proper pins that you're wanting to set up, the proper um, SPI module, remember there's A and there's B. So in this case we're setting up the first one, A. Anytime we reference it, we're going to be the SPI 0 or A. And we will, of course, set all the different bytes associated with all the data. If we were looking at the speed, this is the, uh, the exercise. So what speed is this sending at? So let's, uh, well, let's look earlier. BDBR, so in the SPCMD0. We have 7 is set up, or 007, 00. Oops. Everything else is 0 everywhere else. So the speed here is going to be base rate, full speed ahead, and SP. B is standing for what? How many bits we're sending, right? So in this case, eight. Eight bits. Yeah, eight bits. It says eight bits. That doesn't seem right, does it? 
I'll have to look at that in more detail as well. So uh, we said full speed ahead because the other register we want to set for sending is SPCR. And SPCR is zero. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. That one right there. SPCR is 6B. So what does 6B stand for? Transmitter. Pardon me? It's in master mode. Transmitter. Oh, SPCR. Yeah, that's right. What's the value of 6B? Get my calculator out. So I said 6B, right? 107? So this value over here is going to be 0 with a 107 value in here, so it's going to be not at the full speed, is it? We'll have to look at that to uh, see what speed that is. And then finally the transmit. This is where we set it correctly. So I guess we uh, turn it off to keep it from, uh, uh, keep it from interrupting. This is the bit that says, is it free, is the uh, buffer free to send? Specifically the I, D, L, and F. Then whatever you're sending, it's going to be eight bits at a time, the low word, the high word. And uh, again, you'll sit and wait until things are, are free to go after you've written it out. And then, um, I'm going to have to look at this because this is a little bit confusing to me to see if you could actually receive. And then you can turn the, uh, uh, the device off. So, this should be enough information to do one of the problems in there. I didn't get the I squared C. But again, take a look at the, uh, with respect to the notes here and also the book for I squared C and you could uh, replicate some of the code that's available. Again, its address for the accelerometer is uh, 3A. Alright. That is all I have time for today. Thank you very much. Alright, this, uh, this short presentation on I squared C is uh, just going to cover some of the concepts. We'll have some code at the end, but uh, this will be an augmentation of some of the earlier lectures uh, on communications in general. And uh, again, just for my uh, education, how many of you have had a communications class where you looked at protocol? I mean, you're like half and half, like you're not sure? Which protocol? Any protocol, just the general concepts of protocols, not too many, all right? So if you remember, uh, like I've mentioned in class before, that some of the protocol is you do this, then you expect something back. You do this, you expect something back, something along that line. So I squared C has its own little protocol associated with who gets access. Now the neat thing is it's what's called a two-wire bus. And you can communicate to a whole bunch of different devices with only two wires going into your microcontroller. And you could connect up to, I believe it's 255 different devices. Now the problem with that is that you can communicate with 255 different devices on one, on one wire. Uh, as you can imagine, imagine in the old days of telephones, right? Anybody remember those? Yeah. Everybody had the same wire. Party line. So party line, when you pick up the wire, you could hear anything that's going on. 
So the, uh, the problem associated with that is that nowadays when you have the telephone, you have an individual wire from the switch all the way to your house. Back in the old days, everybody just grabbed onto the wire, well, you know, figuratively, hooked up to the wire to see, is that call for me? No. And then other people could listen in. Uh, same idea here. You actually grab access to the bus by dropping one of the lines. And then after that, you have access to the bus until you release it. And then one of the other devices there says, oh, it's free. I can go get it. The big problem comes if two do it at exactly the same time. Uh, and that makes this a collision-based bus. So we're going to look at I squared C as an example of a uh, collision-based bus. By the way, Ethernet is also a collision-based bus as opposed to token ring. I talked about token ring in a previous class, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, in this case, you have two things that are very important. Number one is you have all of your devices. And notice that no one device is really the master. Sometimes you can assign a master. The other thing is that everything is pulled up to power by the use of pull up. These would be pull up capacitors, right? Pull up resistors, right? And each line has a, uh, a clock and a, and a data line, or each device has a clock and a data line. Now if we look at this example, we have internally some aspects of this device and I'm looking for, here we have uh, power, ground, oh, no. oh here we go. I'm looking for the, um, the actual line, that, oh the accelerometer, so it doesn't have an input line, right? So my accelerometer is going to identify X, Y, and Z, and oh, by the way, if this were a, uh, uh, another type of device, like I uh, had a gyroscope inside, something we often call an IMU, Inertial Measurement Unit, IMU, very useful for um, being able to identify both acceleration and your altitude, attitude, yaw pitch, whatever. So, in this case, we have this device whose I squared C address is 3A. By the way, it says one master controlling the bus. I've seen situation, well, let's just say, let's make it easy. One master controlling the bus, but the, uh, the devices themselves sometimes, no, I'm thinking of another one, never mind. Uh, different properties, by the way, Renesas likes to add a name to everything, so it is the Renesas Inter-Integrated Chip I squared C bus. Even though it says it could uh, communicate at one megabits per second, most devices can't handle anything that fast, and oh, by the way, the further and further you get away, just like an SPI, uh, the most uh, the more and more problems you have associated with it. Oh, forgot to say, I said 255. No, I'm sorry, it's actually 128 because one of the other bits is used for read or write. And again, uh, this works best when everything is maintained on the same board. So you usually have a lot of different chips on the same physical board. It's really not good to go off the board itself. Again, the two wires, the serial clock and the serial data. And you toggle them in a fashion that will allow you to uh, uh, transfer data fairly quickly. So, in the case of anything going on, a device wanting to transfer data actually pulls down the SDA line. Notice there's no other sort of confirmation. So if you want to have access to this, if you want to have access to the I squared C bus and transfer information, you will have to listen, and if you hear nothing going on, then you pull down the line. Because it would be really bad form to have somebody communicating already on the bus, 
In other words, the SDA line is, is down, and oh, by the way, the clock line is running, and then you say, oh, that's time for me to start doing something. No. You have to wait until both SCL and SDA are high. Now, the nice thing is, you don't have to worry about that. All you have to worry about is saying, I want to transmit this data on the I squared C bus and the hardware itself, that hardware that was designed by Renaissance or in the case of uh, this chip. This is, uh, oh, who did this one? Analog devices. Yeah, probably analog devices. They're one of the big, uh, uh, one of the big manufacturers. So again, if the bus is held high, it is free. Star condition is done by a, uh, or, or uh, I, is controlled by the device. And when you're ready to give up control of the bus, you issue a stop. In other words, you, you raise that, uh, that line. And again, it's while both of these are high, because the expectation is you pull down SDA, and then you start clocking. And when you start clocking, that's the synchronous edge where the data is also put on the data line. So you address the specific device with an address between 1 and 28, or I should say between 1 and 7F. And then you have an extra bit which says whether or not you want to read or write. And a, uh, another bit is transmitted with each byte or an act of sorts. By the way, the slave device provides an act which is synchronous with the clock to acknowledge that it actually read it. And, and why would you think you'd need to do that? Why do you need the actual um, slave device to respond? If one tied up the line, no you have to communicate. They want you actually is communicating. All right. Uh, to keep you from holding onto the line, that's one. It's a little bit more basic than that. It's a synchronous communication. So All right. You're synchronous, which means you're sending out to somebody based on an address. Be nice to, to know if the other device is actually listening, right? Because since this is address based. You don't know if the other device is actually listening. Now keep in mind, this is a, a pretty low-level protocol. All it determines is who gets access to that. It doesn't say anything about the data. Like, what does it mean when you're sending uh, uh, the data A0 from the Renaissance microcontroller over to the, uh, over to the um, accelerometer? However, there may be a protocol in place that says when you send the address, when the Renaissance processor sends the address out to the accelerometer, and what was the address of the accelerometer again? A3. A3? 3 a Well, let's look back at that. So it was 3A, and again, we said the... Where is this read bit? Here we go. And you also have the bit identified saying that the master wants to, um, is high, the master wishes to read from the slave. That's the, uh, that's the instruction to the slave device, that device being the accelerometer, to start sending, was it three bytes of data or six bytes of data? How many bytes is, does this accelerometer use? Six. It uses six? I have no idea. <laughs> it would be a good thing to, for you to find out. I might make that a test question. So here's an example. The 7-bit uh, address 3A is sent. You pulled it down, and then it started uh, clocking. Three, 
A, here's, uh, let's see if we can pick out the, uh, the A aspect of this. What is, what is A? It's one, zero, one, zero. And then there's the AC right here. All the way at the end. Whoops. There we go. So that would be a situation of that. And then it sends, uh, oh, then it's requesting data. So let's look. How many bytes is this? Uh, read, write bit is, I think it's down, right? That looks down. This looks down. So that means it's going to send something to it, and then all the way at the end, then it stops the clock and then raises the stop again. And then somebody else is probably going to pull this down. It might be the uh, accelerometer. And I'd have to dig into this to see uh, what it actually is saying. It looks like it's doing the same thing. Looks like it is the 7-bit uh, address again is uh, 3A. Looks like it's uh, read again. So it might be send this, send this. So the, the simple example, um, I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we've done it already for the uh, SPI, but this sets up several aspects of the, uh, the control byte for I squared C. And then we have the simple here, uh, go ahead and uh, send the byte, uh, send start. And then send stop. In other words, it's going to start and stop the uh, specific, the specific uh, transmission. And here, let me just go to an example. You're going to start to send something. These are the bytes that you want to send. <clears throat> then you'll stop. Then you'll send start again. Here it is, uh, the transmission again. Then you stop. So this is what you would put in your main code to be able to send something off to the accelerometer. Some of the code that would allow you to do this, let's see what we have here. Write byte. So as a part of this, the unsigned care slave address, unsigned care slave register number. Oh, that's read, sorry. Write is the address, and then the unsigned care data byte. Looks like it has more than one. And it responds with a one. I'm looking to see if this is successful. Oh, let's tell me this. Is one successful or unsuccessful? Unsuccessful. All right. So it returns zero if it's successful, right? And then here's our read byte. This is the, uh, the process that you uh, use to be able to uh, read a byte off of the I squared C. So the code is made available to you. All right, that is it for I squared C.